this is a sort of a, uh, I have a, actually two parts to this presentation. Uh, and it's a little bit of a, uh, it's a little different perhaps than uh, where we were going earlier in terms of the complication. And I'll, um, I'll show this to you. So this is a 48-year-old healthy male. He had a headache in 2009. There was an incidental finding of a uh, left frontal osteoma. No sign of symptoms at all. Followed with CTs. Here's the scan. So here's the one in 2009, and that represents the largest diameter of that osteoma. And here in 2015, that represents the largest diameter of the osteoma in 2015. So obviously there was significant, a significant increase in size. And uh, in my mind, uh, their trajectory was obvious and that surgery was indicated. So it seemed that in this particular case, it had been given an appropriate trial of conservative management, didn't work, got bigger, and it was time to do something. So <clears throat> here's his scan. I think you can see from this scan that that's pretty darn amenable to a, uh, an endoscopic approach, right? There's a, there's a lot of room uh, to the skull base. There's, there is a good AP room, and you can see that he had favorable anatomy. And in fact, uh, the anatomy was favorable in the sense that you really only had to go in on the patient's left side because there's the, there's the septation, the frontal sinus, and you can stay all the way on the patient's left side. So this is an approach... Uh, that was, you can call it a draft three, I actually call it a draft two C, where you're just going in on one side and actually don't disturb the frontal recess on the patient's right side at all. Kind of a cool operation, really like it. Intraoperatively, this is sort of the beginning. You can see the osteoma. Uh, this is a larger exposure, and now we have, we're only on the patient's left side, and we have a really complete exposure of that osteoma. <laughs> Looks great, right? I mean, what could be better? Uh, so I, I take a drill, and I'm drilling, and I drill. Uh, I decide that I can't just extract that osteoma as it is, so I'm going to bivalve it, right? I'm going to cut it in the middle, and I'm going to extract it. Uh, so I'm doing that, and I'm cutting it in the middle, and I'm extracting it, and it looks great, and here it is. I get it out. That's one half. That's the other half. I mean, like, you know, there's a little celebration going on. Um, <clears throat> and here's how he looks post-op, right? So what could be better? Uh, beautiful result, beautiful result. He comes in. When will my, uh, two weeks, when will my sense of smell come back? And I'm like, oh, well, I was only on the left side anyway, so it'll come back. I mean, you've got some inflammation. I mean, who knows what's going on, but it's definitely going to come back. Comes in at six weeks. When will my sense of smell come back? I'm like, huh, okay. He's looking pretty good. I figure that he really should be recovering his sense of smell by about now. At three months, he's got an upset of 26 out of 40. He's got moderate microsmia. So he's not anosmic, right? He's not 10 out of 40, which would be um, anosmia. Um, but he's moderately microsmic. And, you know, this is a complication. This is unexpected. This is uh, something that, frankly, um, I don't even know if I talked to him about it in advance, to be perfectly honest. I, sure, I talked about CSF leaks. I talked about orbital injury. I talked about bleeding. I talked about you know, uh, additional sinusitis that I might cause a stenosis or a problem, all that stuff. I, I'm not really sure I talked to him about this. And he's actually fine with it. I mean, he's, you know, I'm like, you know, the surgery went well. I show him the pictures you know, each time and how good the surgery looks. And it's obvious that it looks good. Um, and he's not tremendously upset, but, you know, He's, uh, I made him worse. And uh, here's the part that's disturbing. I don't know why, right? I don't know exactly what I did. The surgery went great. I was only on one side, in a sense, right? I crossed over the nasal septum, but I didn't, you know, cross over into the, um, all the way over to the other side. And um, at this point, um, I really don't have an answer for what I should do differently in the future. And that's the thing that's most disturbing to me. So... Uh, the section on the right and left sides are not equivalent. Uh, so when we looked at, at people who have sinus surgery, we actually do a better job of dissecting on the patient's left side than we do on the patient's right side. And complications are more common on the right side than the left side. Uh, and this was really surprising. In a review, there were three orbital hematomas and two CSF leaks all on the right side in those 1,000 cases. Another 1,000 cases, all orbital and CSF leak complications occurred on the right. And in this last review of 1,000 ethmoidectomies, this is an older paper, so it was undoubtedly intranasal, without 13 complications on the right and two on the left. This was a very humbling paper, a group of papers that I looked at. And there's, this is us, 
right? This isn't anomalous on, on the CT scan. This isn't something unusual. It's not a difference in bleeding from the right and left sides because the patients are probably about the same. This is something that we do. And so I, I always caution um, myself and my residents to make sure I turn the head properly, pay special attention on the right side because we're just worse on the right than we are on the left for right-handed. <laughs>